Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over Synopsis with Brett Murdoch, who's going to talk today about the reliability of enterprise-class DRAM. Brett, where are we today with the reliability of DRAM, particularly in the enterprise? In the enterprise-class space, we're seeing a lot more demand for higher reliability systems. We want systems that are going to last us longer and cost us less because we're not replacing them as often. And with the new DDR5 standard from JEDEC, we're seeing some increased reliability functionality built into these DRAMs. So we can talk about how we can use that functionality and how we can improve upon it for the DDR5 and DDR4 class enterprise systems. An enterprise is typically a company versus a cloud type of system, right? You're going to see a little bit of both, actually. Uh, you'll see enterprise class with the cloud because of, again, needing to have that high reliability. You like your family pictures to be nicely maintained and not disappear. The same way you want that million dollar transfer to make sure it goes from where you sent it to where it's going. And in the enterprise, what you're worried about here is if you have downtime, it costs you money. It definitely costs you money. Both the downtime costs you money and replacing of componentry costs you money. And typically it's a large component that gets replaced. Why don't you draw this out for us? Let's do that. Brett, what are we looking at here? What I have here is a small table illustrating some of the different kind of reliability, accessibility, and serviceability, or RAS features, associated with both DDR4 and DDR5 class DRAMs. So you can see I have four different rows here. I have DDR4 devices, DDR4 RDIMs and LRDIMs, DDR5 devices, and DDR5 RDIMs and LRDIMs. And the R stands for registered DIM, and the LRDIM stands for load reduced DIM. Here I have the different classes of RAS features that are available for each. And I've done a little checkbox in X to kind of show you as a summary what you can find in terms of the feature set associated with a particular device or DRAMs. As an example, if we look at ECC, ECC is really relevant for things that are on a DIM, a UDIM, RDIM, LRDIM, not so relevant for the actual devices themselves. If we look at write CRC, this is available in all things up here, both DDR4 devices and DIMMs, as well as DDR5 devices and DIMMs. When I go to read CRC, you can see that DDR5 has introduced this new feature to help again with enhanced reliability with the new standard. And then finally, we'll talk about CA Parity. It's available in both DDR4 DIMMs and devices, DDR5 DIMMs, but not DDR5 devices. Any difference in terms of performance and also power for each one of these? Absolutely. You're going to see that ECC will require a little more power because you have extra devices to support it. You'll see that both read and write CRC are going to impact your bandwidth and your latency numbers a little bit. And then CA parity, uh, when you have an issue, you'll definitely see a bandwidth and latency impact. And cost differential between the DIMMs versus the different DDR devices is not the, ma the major factor in a lot of these systems, right? It's more a question of how well it functions over time, how much it costs to operate this. Exactly. Most, con most consumers are interested in a DDR device, but in an enterprise class system, it's always going to be a DIMM. Usually an RDIMM, sometimes an LRDIMM. Depends entirely on how much memory is required in that system. How is ECC implemented here? That's a great question. I have a diagram over here and we'll walk through an ECC implementation. I show three different components to the DRAM subsystem. The DDR controller, DDR5, and then the actual DIMMs and devices themselves on the far side. Typically in a system, the way it works is you're going to get data that comes in from the system, goes into your DDR controller, which is going to be used to optimize your traffic stream to your DRAM in a way that's friendly for the DRAM to operate. That write data comes into your controller. Before it gets sent out across the bus to the FI, we generate ECC. And this ECC is extra data bits that are carried along the side of the normal data bits. So this will go out to the FI, through the FI, across your board, and into the DRAM. If you're using a DIM, typically for a DDR4 system, it's a 72-bit DIM, 64 bits of data and 8 bits of ECC. If you're using a new DDR5-based DIM, it's a dual-channel DIM with 80 bits wide, consisting of two 40-bit channels of 32 bits of data and 8 bits of ECC. So all this data is stored in the devices that are located on the DIM. Or alternatively, if you're using only devices, with extra devices, you can construct something that looks like a DIM and has a place to store the check bits associated with your data. And there's a couple different kinds of checking that you can do with the data, depending on how wide your actual DRAMs are. If you're using by 8 de devices or by 16 devices, typically you'll do a SecBed implementation, which stands for Single Error Correction Dual Error Detection. 
If you're using by four devices, then you can use an advanced ECC algorithm, uh, sometimes called chip kill, that allows one of the devices to actually go offline and the system to still operate. So you've got your data going out into memory. What do you have to think about on the system side when that data comes back? Well, the important question when the data comes back is whether the data comes back correctly or not. So of course we've stored out here in our memory the data as well as the check bits. We read it back bidirectional across the board, comes back in unidirectional from the PHY. First thing it hits is our ECC checking and correction block. Here's where we're going to see is there any issue or not. If there's an issue, we'll correct it. If not, we'll simply pass the data straight through to the read data buffer and the controller then will return that data back to the system in a known good way once the data has been manipulated properly. This checking block will also see is there a problem with the data and if so, it will let the system know. It's going to go to some error logic and it's going to tell the system either I had a, an error with the data and I was able to fix it or I had an error with the data and I was not able to fix it. And then we have to think about what to do with that. You've got a lot more data than you did in the past. How is that being handled today? In terms of error checking, it's a pretty much the same principle we've been using since DDR4. Now there's some other features that help add a little bit more integrity to the system and we'll talk about those next. Brett, what are we looking at here? Here I've illustrated a basic uh, DRAM subsystem implementing CRC checks. Both write CRC checks for DDR4 and DDR5 as well as read CRC which is new for DDR5. So again we'll follow the flow of the data through the system. Typically it starts coming from the system comes into the memory controller, goes through the right data buffer. As it's going out, there's a CRC block that will calculate the data as it passes by and send that out to the system. And as you can see up here for DDR4 or DDR5, the way CRC works is a little different than ECC, where ECC was carried along beside the data. The CRC is on the same channel and occurs just after the data. So with DDR4 systems, there's a burst length of eight, so you have eight beats of data followed by your two beats of CRC. And whether you're using a BY4 device or BY8-16 impacts whether or not you have two beats of checks or just one beat of check and a beat of ones because you can't break up to a one UI interface. With DDR5, we've moved to burst length of 16. So here we have 16 data beats still followed by two beats of CRC data. Is DDR5 always faster and lower power than DDR4 or is it is there something else of why you'd want to use that? What's, what's your metric for choice? The metric for choice today is very simple. For the enterprise class customer who requires a higher bandwidth, even though it is a larger device, a more expensive device, and your system will use more power because you're running it faster, you'll move to DDR5. Even though a DDR5 device by itself, if you do an apples to apples comparison, should be lower power because it has a lower voltage than a DDR4 device. And in the enterprise, when you're talking about power, you're talking about power to keep these things running. You're talking about power to cool. It's a, an actual and possibly thousands of servers that are using this too, right? That's right. Typically, your largest expense in your data system can't your data center. Sorry, can be your air conditioning. And there is a thing that's going on in the data centers where uh, a lot of systems in your mobile systems or your inter, or your uh, IoT systems, everything's focused on a very low power in a resting state, like your phone that's sitting in your pocket not being used. In data centers, you're on all the time, 24-7, 365. So power is very important. So what happens when the data moves beyond the controller and actually into the, the DIM? Okay, once you go past the controller and the PHY, you've constructed your burst, 18-bit burst in the case of DDR5, the device will actually accept all the data. This is true of D4, D5. It will accept the data beats. It will do its own CRC calculation, and then it will check to see, did all the bits come across the interface as expected? If so, great. If not, what it'll do is it'll generate an internal error. It will commit that data to memory, but it will come back with an alert signal that it'll send back to the system to say, hey, there was a problem with this transaction. It will also record this information in the mode registers to the memory. Similarly, if you're doing read data for DDR5 systems, DDR4 doesn't have this, but DDR5 systems will calculate CRC with the read data coming back so that when we receive it back at the data buffer in the controller, we can check the CRC here as well. And then if there's an error, we can send a signal off to our error logic. So we can get an error either because of a problem transmitting the data to the device or an error in receiving the data from the device. So Brett, we've got the data, we've got the control. What happens when you have an error? A basic system 
can take all the different error sources and bring it into their error logic. Things like a correctable ECC, you can actually correct and send good data back to the system. But with uncorrectable ECC errors, read CRC errors, or if you have an alert problem, you need to take some kind of action. Again, a basic system, you can just send a system interrupt, but typically what that's gonna do is result in the, the blue screen of death. And you're just gonna have to replace components in the system, and you're gonna have to bring the system offline almost immediately. However, you can take a little bit more of an intelligent approach to the problem. As an example, in the Designware DDR controller that we have, when we have an error come out from one of these things, we'll route it down here to our retry blocks, where we've kept a long history of the commands that have been issued to the memory, as well as a history of the data that's been provided to the memory. So now, when I get one of these errors that normally would cause us to shut down, I can go back out to the system and retry whatever transaction I made that resulted in the error and see was that perhaps some sort of transient error that can be overcome simply by rerunning the transaction. And if so, now I don't have to bring my system offline, at least not immediately. Maybe I flag something to the designer, let them know there is potentially a problem in the system, but for now I'm still up and running. Really what you're doing here is repairing transient problems, right? Absolutely. So when we have that transient issue, it doesn't have to be a fatal flaw in the system. If for some reason you did get that right CRC error because you had an alpha particle strike or something fabulous like that, and you rerun the transaction, it may be successful the second time, and you've saved yourself a lot of heartache and a lot of money, in fact. So looking at this all together, what have you actually accomplished here? Let's go back to our original chart, and we can see the different kind of reliability features associated with the different DRAM classes. So we kind of walked through today how these are implemented and how they're used. And then we talked about the different errors that we'll get back from the DRAMs or from the DIMs indicating there's a problem. Of course, you can take a very simplistic approach and just let your system know there was an issue. Or what we talked about then at the very end is trying something again with the memory subsystem and seeing if you can recover from a transient error, save yourself some heartache, save yourself some dollars, and have a little bit more robust system in the end because of it. Brett Murdoch, thanks for a great explanation. Thanks, Ed.